it's my head from ethical screening again. And the purpose of these is these little chats is essentially to put a human face to the company behind the money. Essentially, it's that there is a world of fact sheets, there's a world of information on everything. But what clients really want to know is where the money's invested and the people who are looking after it and what motivates them almost. It's more interesting to know that you know, the people there are aligned in terms of their views than that they're very, you know, people take for read that you're going to be good at the financial side of things, that you're going to be making sure that everything is done in the way that they'd expect. This is about adding context. It's about understanding what it is about the organisation that makes the people at the other end feel like, oh, great, I like Eden Tree. They sound like my sort of people. If you can briefly explain what you do at Eden Tree and who Eden Tree are, that would be, we'll go on from there. Brilliant. Well, good morning, Mike. It's lovely to, to be uh, hooked up with you. So I'm Neville White. I'm Head of Responsible Investment at Eden Tree. Um, Eden Tree is a boutique investment management company owned by the Benefac Group. Um, people may know it as the Ecclesiastical Insurance Group. Ultimately, we're owned by a charity, which makes us a very unusual financial services company. And Eden Tree is the wholly owned investment management part of that insurance company. Um, based in London, we are practitioners in responsible and sustainable investment. That's all we do. It's all we've ever done. Um, we've got around 35, 36 years of experience just working in the ethical Back then it was called ethical and now responsible and sustainable investment space. So, so that's me and that's us. So what does the head of responsible investment do? I am responsible for policy, strategy, um, making sure that actually the investments that go into the, 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 the funds are suitable. So I have a team of five people, including myself, and our primary job is to assess the suitability of stocks for going into the funds. And we have a very unusual model in that, whilst the fund managers are stock pickers, stock selectors, um, it sits with my team to determine the suitability based on our screening process. So we screen, we engage with companies, we do all of the voting, um, the governance, public policy, and then we also do um, research, which is all on our website. So that's what the head of responsible investment does. I have four talented people, but essentially my overall role is to ensure um, policy strategy and that we maintain our integrity in the marketplace around everything we do. So which way around does it work? Presumably you don't look at every company and come up with a list of what's acceptable. The manager decides, I'd like, here's my shopping list, if you like, of the companies I'd like to invest into. They then give that to you and you say, oh, how funny, that's an arms company. We'll put that on one side and you go through in that way. Absolutely. And that's actually what is, is a really interesting way to invest. We're bottom up stock pickers and essentially we have no universe. Um, the fund managers all know what we cannot hold in terms of the ethical screens, gambling, tobacco, arms, that kind of thing. But essentially, they are stock pickers one by one, case by case. They will do the investment and economic analysis of a stock that they're interested in. When they get to a point where they feel the valuation's right, they have conviction, they will pass it to us to screen. So there's a parallel process of some of the investment analysis and then the responsible and sustainable analysis going on together. So I don't have to monitor a universe, which is great. We literally just build up an enormous library and archive of stocks which we've approved or indeed failed. Okay, which means you don't have to screen an index, which... No. Yeah. I've always found that fascinating, the idea that people are screening companies that nobody is really statistically going to invest into. Yeah, I mean, it's... It, it could be assumed to be a kind of hit and miss approach, but I think it's a very classic active manager approach. You know, we're an active manager house. And as you know, there's a lot of argument and debate around passives versus actives. We feel our, our, our proprietary strength is in qualitative thinking around conviction stocks. We're a values house principally. Um, that comes in and out of fashion, but a lot of the fund managers are looking for value plays that are underappreciated in the market, but have good fundamentals. We will be doing the ESG analysis separately and then making a call on suitability. And, and those are reviewed once we've said something is suitable, 
level. It's monitored on an ongoing basis in terms of news flow controversies, and it gets a full refresh, if you like, periodically, just to ensure that it still remains suitable. Um, and of course, along the way, we have things that fail. So a fund manager may not realize that something is going to fail when they send it to us, and neither would we. It's the analysis and the deep dives we do that will make the final recommendation. The active versus passive thing, and we're sort of going to touch upon labels in a minute, um, is going to get interesting, I think, because um, passives have their place, there's no doubt about that. But the difficulty is you have funds that hold a number of stocks and you can look at every one. So the, the expectation of unexpected holdings, um, you have a pretty good handle on everything that you've got. But if you're tracking an index, how? How are they going to do that? I know I'm asking the wrong person because you don't do that, but it, just, it strikes me as, I think, the, I think the last time I looked, the LNG ESG tracker, whichever one it is, had got sort of 1,800 holdings or something. It's sort of like, if one accepts that nobody knows what's unexpected because mm -hmm. to everybody something is unexpected, are they, is the regulator realistically expecting them to list every one of those and say what the company does and all the rest of it? I think that's a logical conclusion, but I just don't see how you can do that. I mean, what's interesting, I was looking back quite recently at, um, if you like, our 15, 20 year history, and we've had no major blow ups of companies that we've said were suitable for the funds. And I think that's because of the active deep dives we do, we have a really good understanding of what we're putting in. I think the problem with a passive or a tracker is, is you may eliminate the tobaccos and things you absolutely don't want, but you have no idea, for instance, what the ESG um, fundamentals are around, say, a Boohoo, which blew up fairly recently. Now, Boohoo, we, we've not screened Boohoo, but that would simply fail our process. So we kind of know before we get anywhere near it going into a fund, what are the weak spots? What are the things that are attractive? What would actually detract from that? I think if you just have a tracker, and we've been fairly outspoken to say, and you could say we would say that, we've been fairly outspoken in saying, if ESG matters at all, we don't feel you can really do it justice via a passive or a tracker approach. It's, it's a really human a deep dive analysis approach. Um, we don't use algorithms. We don't use ratings agencies. It's all people powered. And I think um, that just makes far stronger outcomes. And if you look at proportionately, probably the number of blow ups some of our peers may have because they're not really on top of every stock in the in the portfolio versus ourselves, um, we're in a really good place. I'm not saying things would never blow up. Uh, everybody was taken by surprise by Ericsson imploding last year. That was quite unexpected and quite unusual. But I think the things that you, you know, the known, the known unknowns, you know, the BP has a poor safety history. You know, Boohoo is fast fashion with lots of labor issues. You can predicate against putting stuff like that into your portfolio as an active manager, which perhaps you can't do if you're following a tracker or a passive. So how long have you been at Eden Tree? I've been here 13 years, but 27 years all told in the industry. Okay, so in 13 years, you've gone from, because I've been doing this almost since I had a fringe. <laughs> um, you've gone from it being ethical. So basically it's, mm. it's screen to avoid. As long as you're not bad, you're, you're included. And that isn't actually that, that far in the, in the distant past. And it's only really what, Five, six, seven years where there's been a, uh, a change in that I think from a client perspective there's an expectation that the ethical is already taken account of so that the the ESG SDG net zero stuff that's come along subsequently I think what's interesting I, I believe is that the expectation of the investor is that well of course you don't but the expectation in certain parts of the industry which I think is where greenwashing becomes an issue is they think that some of the ESG numbers justify holding things that clients wouldn't expect to see. Mm. I think that's absolutely true. And I, I find it fascinating having, having started in 1997 and seeing an industry really transform itself fairly regularly. Um, and I went through the SRI 
phase, you know, when Tony Blair tweaked the Pensions Act, and SRI has completely disappeared, and yet that was the terminology for quite a long time. And now nobody will talk about that. It's all ESG. I think some of the, I mean, we may touch on this, but a lot of the a lot of the transitions that the industry has gone through have been unhelpful because we just seem to have more and more terminology nobody understands and terminology that is interpreted differently between clients, investors. And then, of course, that's when the regulator gets worried. But I think your fundamental point is is, is right. I mean, I'm an, I, I would believe myself to be an ethicist by training. Therefore, I never underplay the ethics and the business ethics. I believe responsibility is the most important thing to some extent. The business cannot be sustainable unless it's responsible, which is why we are a responsible and sustainable house. But I think clients are becoming, there, there, is, a, there is sometimes a disconnect between clients understanding what is possible, what investors can, what, what fund managers can deliver. But equally that point you make about the ethics, I think is probably now quite underplayed by a lot of fund managers, and that then leads to surprises. So you see a sustainability fund with Shell in it, and then the fund manager argues, well, Shell is a transition stock, whereas a lot of the underlying clients will say, well, I don't see Shell like that. So there's wriggle room for debate, but I think from looking at it from a regulatory point of view, it makes it really important that the fund management house sets out really clearly the objectives of any product, what that product is designed to do, and exactly what you might expect to see in it and not. The knowledge that the industry has about what companies are doing is, is in most cases extremely impressive, but then it gets hidden within enormous reports that are almost impenetrable. Yes, uh, and I think you know, these kind of conversations help to tease out exactly what an individual fund house is, is doing or thinking. And, and one of the solutions to overzealous regulation is, in my view, you know, better comply or explain. I think it's absolutely the role of the fund manager house to be as transparent as possible about what each product is designed to do. So if you have no ethical screen, and you're going to include a tobacco company, you should have case studies of why that would be appropriate for that product. The end, the end time, you know, I still believe in buyer beware, but you do have to take your clients or potential clients with you. And you don't want them being disappointed by investing something which two years later, they think they've been missold a product. And I think what lies all behind this, you know, the, the, the usual elephant in the room is mis-selling. Everybody feels there is going to be some kind of mis-selling challenge around ESG products. And so the regulation is designed to kind of preempt that. Um, that I think with, with better transparency and, and better objectives being being published would help to um, prevent prevent the whole greenwashing thing. But you're right to an extent. I mean, you know, the combined knowledge on my team and the way we do it, we, we, we tell clients that in meetings, but it's very difficult to articulate that on paper or in dry and dusty pieces of research that sit on the website. It comes alive when you're having a one-to-one -one conversation with a client about um, the peer review we do, the screening process, how long it takes, why something would fail, what we're looking for, all those kind of pinch points that build up towards the whole process, um, which you can see on the website, but the process hides quite a lot of deep thinking behind it, which gets to the point of saying company A is suitable. Um, now, I don't know how our peers work, but obviously I think it's, it's really important that we all try and be as transparent as possible. It's in nobody's interest to have regulation that is going to be burdensome and all regulation to an extent is burdensome. I think it will help, but unfortunately we've created this problem for ourselves by having so much language nobody understands, not taking people with us, and the kind of inevitable greenwash of people saying, well, why have you got Shell in that fund? And there being no obvious explanation, which actually should all be out there already. It, it's, the, it's the thing is that, that the industry has changed so much in a short period of time because of the amount of information that's available, the fact that there's so much regulation from Europe, uh, et cetera, and that as a consequence, because I don't think that with ethical funds, there were many instances of I mean, it wouldn't be greenwashing, but it would basically be criteria breaking because the fund managers were much cognizant of the fact that that's not a great look. If you've got a policy of, you know, no arms, oppressive regimes, whatever it might be, if somebody finds out that you are actually investing into some of the worst industries out there, it is very damaging. And the problem is that once the ESG thing gathered the almost unending momentum that it has, 
that's when the marketing departments got very excited and thought we've got to have one of these ah. and we've changed the name of a fund where nothing else has changed um, and something went awry at that point in time it, it's simply it's simply a a facet of the industry growing incredibly quickly at pace with new entrants now there aren't there aren't that many people in the industry working in environmental, social, and governance, the discipline is still very small. Um, I find it incredibly difficult to hire people when we want them because the, the 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 pool is very small. But you've got titanic new entrants coming in, big, really big fund managers, and I think that has also lent itself to ratings agencies and algorithms rather than real people. And as soon as you start using an algorithm to determine what goes into a fund, you kind of begin to lose the plot around risk i think and so there there is a mismatch between the number of the amount of talent in the industry to support something that has grown really quickly and at pace versus things that could go wrong as a result of that um and probably we're at some sort of tipping point now because we've seen in europe you know funds that were uh, article nine have deregistered themselves to go back to Article 8 because they simply cannot meet the expectations of the regulation. The UK is in a slightly better place because it's taking its time to look at what Europe's doing, but hopefully to make some sounder outcomes and judgments. That's to be seen. Um, but there's still quite a lot to play for in how this will look in five years' time, I think. The, um, yes, well, as ethical screening is very much a human research rather than a, a data scrape researcher, uh, I completely agree with you there. It takes an awfully long time to look at companies. If all you do is just get some, you know, three, four, five, six hundred data points on the company and use that, run it, run it through the machine and say, oh, you've got a 71 out of 100, and that's as far as it goes. Um, mm. That's when I think the problem arises. And it's interesting that the data providers themselves have made clear that is what we do. I think the problem is not the data providers, it's how it's being used. Yeah. It's that the, the fund managers don't want to employ the people to spend the time trolling through it all. And the idea that, I mean, this, this, the, my, other, my current bugbear is the thing that is, is AI. People talking about AI and research. It's not, it's just, it's just data grabbing, which is mm. machine learning. It's nothing more than that. But at the end of it, um, it's all about the old double materiality, isn't it? If you haven't worked out that a company with a good score makes bonds, you probably need to have another look at your process because that's <laughs> what the client is expecting. I think that's right. But I, I think companies are, are doing this for efficiency reasons. But equally, if you take if you if you push all those companies through the MSCI ratings and you decide as a as a as a house that anything that gets over 71% based on the um, the MSCI ratings is okay to go in. You will not know what could go wrong. It's purely an arbitrary cutoff. And as I say, our process is very much one human being does the research. It's peer reviewed by the rest of us, and we come to a, a collegiate decision around suitability. We don't. We we take the ratings. We we take a, a company that provides ratings agency. Well, sorry, ratings, and we look at them, but we then we ignore them. They they play no part in our process whatsoever, which sometimes makes clients quite surprised because they're beginning to buy into the mantra that unless you've got a third party ratings agency telling you what to do, you're somehow not quite as good as others. Uh, and we turn it on its head and say, well, actually, no, why would you use an algorithm with an arbitrary cutoff, 71% good, 70% bad, um, rather than have a team of people, but a team of people is expensive. And as I just said, there's not a pool of a huge pool of people out there that can do this which is why the, the, the ratings agencies become a shortcut to building a portfolio of suitability, if you like. Um, and it's just not something that we believe is sustainable in the long term. More will go wrong with those sorts of constructions um, because, as you say, the ratings agencies do what they do and they do them very well, but it's the way it's being used. We, we, we use them as a data dump. We don't use them in any way to drive outcomes. I think, and I've said this for quite a long time, uh, the, the MSCIs of this world, it's your starting point, it's definitely not your finishing point. Mm. It's a fantastic way to, to do that initial filtration. And then, because obviously it's unlikely you're going to be picking up a company that's getting 30 out of 100, because there's got to be something fairly significantly wrong from the data side of it. But mm. beyond that, you begin with this filtration and then you put the people on it to find out what underpins it. 
I, I mean, we, ch we changed our service provider a few years ago because the one we had taken changed their methodology to say, okay, we're now going to move to a risk-based system in which every company will have six risks and we will tell you what those risks are. And we said to them, this is madness. We want to determine what the risks are. We own the stock. We want to be able to say, company A, these are the things that we would look for. And so we actually found the way that service provider was, was beginning to motor their, their algorithms to be really unhelpful because we didn't want to be told what Tesco's risks were, for instance, because we would disagree with them. Unfortunately, the more the industry uses those kind of service providers, the more generic and blob-like the risks are interpreted as. And actually, something could fly in from the left field, take you completely by surprise, because it wasn't one of the six risks you've been looking at. And I think our, our holistic process, we won't always get it right, but our holistic process will look much wider than six risks for every company, because... They, they could be fewer, but more likely they're going to be quite left field and surprise you. Therefore, you need to look for that and, and understand it at the outset. I think for two people who've never met before who are going to talk for 15 minutes, we've talked quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's been very enlightening. You're nice welcome. You. Thank you.